that's, that's one of the stories from Afghanistan. Now, right, I mean, you, you might be aware I've written a, a collection of songs from Afghanistan from the point of view of Australian soldiers, but I, I wrote that one from the point of view of US Marines. I got to know American soldiers because I ended up working quite closely with them there in, in a province called Uruzgan, which was one province over from Helmand. And, uh, and many of those guys had done three, four, five rotations of Afghanistan and Iraq. They got two weeks leave a year. Uh, you know, it defined their lives for a decade. And, and it also ended up defining the Bush presidency. The decisions to go into Afghanistan and Iraq were, better, for better and worse, mostly for worse, his legacy. Um, and of course, he, curiously, he enjoyed a boon in his polls. In October of 2001, when we invaded Iraq, and in March 2003, sorry, October 2001, we invaded Afghanistan, March 2003, we invaded Iraq, and at both points, he got a, pike in the opinion, a spike in the opinion polls, and it's, it's unlike Americans to want to vote against what, they, what Bush himself called a war president. He seemed to enjoy that term uh, more than anyone should. Um, but inevitably, as the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan began to lose their sense of optimism, <laughs> um, Bush's ratings in the opinion polls turned downwards from the 90s to around 26% support by 2009. And I watched this process as I was there, and with it, I watched a more general malaise and deterioration in the political debate. I remember seeing George Bush on television in 2007 complaining about what he called the elites. And I thought, well, he's a president, he's the son of a president. How can he refer to the elites in the third person? Obviously, the Republican Party is getting in the habit of snowing reality and it's that, that severance with reality which has really allowed the ascendance of someone like Donald Trump who doesn't care much for it, who creates his own reality. But the Republicans weren't the only one to blame and in a curious way the digital era is, is responsible for the malaise in modern democracies that we're now experiencing ourselves here in Australia. I remember at the time I had a friend, Mary Sue Tui, you, you know, yeah, she worked for a radio station called Sirius XM. It was like a digital radio station. You know, you paid a subscription fee and you got access to 200 different channels. Um, some of them are music, but some were also talkback. Channel 156 was called Liberal Talkback. Channel 157 was called Conservative Talkback. <coughs> which brought to mind the Paul Simon song, All Lies in Jest Till a Man Hears What He Wants to Hear and Disregards the Rest. And this is, in fact, what has happened in the digital era. We now live in filter bubbles where we are fed the news that we actually are likely to believe and want to hear. And the problem is that, the, you know, that there is no longer any objective truth to underwrite political conversation between the right and the left. And this is why there are deeply rancorous times in American politics and this is part of the malaise we're developing here in Australia. There's no point of discourse between the left and the right. Just extremes in their own little bubbles of reality. It's right. Anyway, as for me, I ended up getting a couple of gigs here and there. Um, and in Fredericksburg, a few other places with Ron Goad, a good friend of ours, around bars in D.C., and then I started to travel further afield on the Eisenhower interstate system. There's this extraordinary system of interstate roads in the United States built by President Eisenhower in the 1950s. He basically persuaded Congress to fund this huge infrastructure project, arguing that they needed to be able to land a plane anywhere in case the Russians invaded. <laughs> I don't know why you have to justify these infrastructure projects on defense grounds. Because um, it turned out to be the artillery, you know, the blood the arterial route for American business. Mm -hmm. The American economy survives mm -hmm. on the interstates. It's, mm -hmm. 
massive. And uh, I travelled all over the United States and got to see much of the country. Um, I always felt a little bit outside there, like I was a bit of an outsider looking in until I finally found my spiritual home at a place called, called the Kerrville Folk Festival. You've been to Kerrville, Stephen? I have not been. Oh, you've not been? Okay. It's a wonderful event every year. It happens for three, three weeks in May every year. Um, and they have performers there who are officially on the bill, but most of the action goes on until four in the morning with people sitting around, sitting around under little tents or around campfires, playing songs, swapping guitars, mm -hmm. um, you know, taking it in turns. I don't know if you've heard Michelle Shock's Texas Campfire recordings. They were recorded there. Um, anyway, they sort of pass the guitar around and drink this kind of Texan beer called Scheiner Bock. Um, made by some German migrants there. And I, and I went there and suddenly felt amongst my people, amongst my you know, believers in the art of song and story, um, venerable old tech songwriters like Jack Williams and Jack Hardy. Uh, you know, I'd play my songs and someone like Jack Hardy would go, you're all right. You can write songs, but boy, let me give you one piece of advice, he said. Whatever you do, don't suck. <laughs> mm. And I think there's something in that for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I got out there touring and met a lot of great guys doing what I was doing. Played gigs with Pat Wichter and Jonathan Bird. You've never heard of these guys, but they're wonderful songwriters and performers. Joe Jenks, Tim on the left there. I don't know if the Pommy guy on the right is. Um, Charlie Roth. You know Charlie, Steve? No, I don't. Okay, yeah. From Minnesota, I managed to play some. I managed to get some gigs in Minnesota in February of 2007. It turned out to be easy to get gigs in Minnesota in February. Um, it's Carlton. It's Carlton. <laughs> 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 and in fact, I bought this guitar there. I'd lost my Canadian-made Larabay guitar in New York City, and, and had a bit of insurance money, and found this in a shop in Saint Paul, Minnesota. Anyway, I was touring there with Charlie. One time, we were driving. Minnesota and we approached a bridge at a town called St. Clair and, and out the bridge we looked out the roof out the, over the railings and he pointed over the railings and he said you see that frozen little stream there and he said that's the beginning of the Mississippi River and the more I traveled around the more I began to wonder at the sheer beauty of the United States it's a beautiful country if you get a chance to go there, go and get out into the countryside. Their rivers and their mountains are breathtaking. It is really a lucky country at that level. Anyway, that was sort of 2007. And by that point, I've begun to wonder whether my monopoly on songs about the Bougainville conflict was going to make me into the next Bruce Spring. <laughs> <laughs> um, I began to doubt. Belief has never been my strong suit. I'm more of a skeptic including when it comes to myself, I suppose. It's the price you pay. Um, anyway, I began to feel the urge to come home where I knew that at least here in Australia people would get my jokes. <laughs> and, uh, and this is a song I wrote in my last tour of, uh, my last tour of the United States in, um, in the winter of 2007. It's called American Guitar. <laughs> a little more <coughs> JFK into the Brooklyn Heights I saw Manhattan shining on that summer night All that real estate and all that cash Can't be hard to make myself a little stash Well, I learned to book the gig 
mistakes and trust my luck I learned on stage it's often better not to suck Met a lot of good men living out of cars Trying to make a living picking their guitars Guys like Steve actually Saw them driving through old towns with their new Walmarts and a ghost town in the heart that made me wonder that they'd go so far just to play on their American guitars Well, the Schuylkill Freeway and the Jersey Pike I rode the interstates they built for Uncle Ike I think I would have liked your eyes and hair A whole lot better than the monkey you got now <laughs> He's got you stuck in the bunker with them Baghdad blues My golden pile Specks of blood upon your shoes. Good intentions, but it's gonna leave a scar. The Arabs will never play American guitar. Graceland thing I've seen the motel Where they finished Dr. King Just like Abraham and JFK Plead the second And God bless the NRA Well it's a natural way To keep a good man down Let some angry bigot Give him six or seven rounds It's a little bit frightening But I've come this far Just to play on an American guitar Well, I've seen the Mississippi frog and it's St. Clair Across the Hudson And the mighty Delaware I've seen the Rocky Mountains Busting young into the sky The Appalachians Aging mellow like a rock It touched my heart It's such a beautiful place The mountains and rivers where I found an easy grace Pretty good reasons to have come this far Just to play on an American guitar at St. Marie Killing 17,000 in a single day Took him a week to lay them underneath the clay They were chasing glory, always going too far
icy snow. Three white crosses on the side of the road. If I should perish, let my mother know. I know she wishes that I was home in bed, making babies like my little brother Ed. Well, I made a name, a little fame, no wealth. Made some friends, learned a lot about myself. Pretty good reasons to have come this far Just to play on this American guitar It's been an interesting afternoon. Steve is here, an American playing on an Australian mate on. <laughs> no, I'm an Australian playing on an American tailor. <laughs> Please a round of applause for Steve. <laughs> <laughs>